Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, uh, to our session on delivering social justice in the new economy. My name is Caroline Casey, and I am the founder and director of The Valuable 500, the global CEO community transforming disability inclusion through business leadership and opportunity, with our very proud partners, the World Economic Forum. Now we have a huge announcement to make on Friday the 29th, which I think really plays into the importance of what we're about to discuss today. Um, but I wanted to just open this up and give a little bit of context. I'm the moderator and just to give the flow of how we're going to spend the next 30 minutes together in the public forum. And then we will be moving to a private session with our members um, between 6.30 and seven o'clock. Um, also to explain to you, um, I am registered blind, so I'm going to give you a very quick audio description of myself uh, for best practice and inclusion. Um, I'm a white woman with blonde hair with a blue background and a pair of black round glasses, apparently look like Edna from The Incredibles. Not sure, but that's where it is. <laughs> I am dialing in from Ireland, Dublin, beside my washing machine. Um, and I just want to, to start by saying we know that video has best captured what is happening in our world. And it's January and we've been here now, it feels like for a very long time. And we are tired, exhausted, worried and frustrated. And yet there is hope too. Um, we know that this global pandemic has also been a pandemic essentially of humanity. It has been the great social inequalizer. The inequalities that existed before our global pandemic have been exas exacerbated. They have been compounded and they are terrifying to look upon. We know that every part of our humanity is suffering in some particular way. And we know when we speak to this, how are we gonna build back better? This great reset, these are all great words. And we know that we have to do it, but how do we do it? How do we really do this? when we have so many agendas on the table, the issues of gender, LGBTQI, age, economy, disability. It's really tough and it's really hard. And I think we have to be honest and be provocative because if it was so easy, we'd have done it better before even now. So today's conversation is going to look at how can we look at all of these unique and pressing agendas within a collective and collaborative intention for full human inclusion, equity and justice within this new economy? What is the role that business has to play? And also looking at some of the great new and most promising initiatives that we have seen. And we've just seen the announcement of one of them with the World Economic Forum today on racial justice. We have panelists who are coming from three very specific areas or two different which is around acad academia, business, and from policy. Because every different field has a different lens. And that's what we're trying to do, try to see how we can move forward together with our different views, our different lens, and our different agendas. So I am going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, to tell you where they're dialing in from, and their name, um, and the current role they have, and if they feel inclined to give a description. So I am going to hand over to uh, Peter Grauer, who I know um, and am a mad fan of uh, for many years. So Peter, over to you first. Thank you, Caroline. And thank you for the opportunity to be here with such an incredibly impressive panel on what's gonna be a very interesting next hour that as it unfolds. Uh, I'm Peter Grauer. Uh, I'm executive chairman of Bloomberg and chair our management committee have been at Bloomberg for almost the last 20 years and have really been the primary spokesperson <clears throat> at the senior most levels of our firm, along with Mike Bloomberg, really putting a stake in the ground about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and trying to address the challenges both within our company and as a global media financial information company going forward. Um. I also want to let everybody know captioning is available. Please use this. Um, it is all, all of the um, sessions on the Davos agenda are captioned. Um, Minister Coutier, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Yes, hello. Good afternoon. My name is Tatiana Cloutier. I'm a Minister of Economics in Mexico, and I'm very, very happy to be here and listen to all this great discussion that, as you say, Caroline, we are going to have to do something very disruptive as to achieve what we have in front of us as a world. Thank you, Minister. Ashley, uh, we, set, we share a Global Future Council together. Would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. I'm Ashley Shelby Rosette. I'm a professor and senior associate dean at the Future School of Business. I'm exceptionally excited to be here amongst this esteemed panel and to take, uh, uh, take part in uh, what is a really important conversation in line with the best practices that Caroline has initiated. Uh, she asked us to describe ourselves. Uh, I am a black middle-aged woman with red glasses and a yellow and brown background. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Carmine, um, another, I'm another fan of yours because both you and Peter are part of the Racial Justice Programme and the Valuable 500. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Caroline. It's great to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Carmine DeCibio. I am uh, the global chairman and CEO of EY. EY is an organization, a professional services organization with over 300,000 people in over 150 countries around the world. And we do value ourselves in terms of being really leaders when it comes to DNI. Um, in terms of me, and uh, uh, I'm uh, sitting uh, about 20 miles west of New York City in a suburb in New Jersey, which is where I'm coming in from. And I do, um, uh, I'm a white male of Italian descent, and I do have a EY background just to make sure that people know where, who I work with. Anyway, that's it, Caroline. Back to you. <laughs> Brand placement, always an opportunity. Um, okay, listen, the first question I want to ask each of you. Um, look, this is the decade of disruption. We know, as the minister says, we're going to have to do things very differently. And we know collaboration, collective power. We know we need to have the intersectional lens. We, need, we know we need to have multi-stakeholder approach. We know all of this. Once again, easier said than done. So I was going to ask each of you from your particular field, what do you see as the barriers to this intersectional multi-stakeholder approach? And because we're going to have some positivity, the opportunity. And Minister, I'm going to go to you first. Okay, well, one of the things that I, uh, one of the big challenges we have at this moment, I believe that is how are we going to be integrating and put in the agenda that it's uh, all these ideas that come out worldwide and that we have to introduce very fast when we have an agenda that has been going on for a longer time and how are we going to be like what it's going to be our priority nonetheless i assume that one of the priorities we're going to have to be facing at this moment it has to do with women how are we going to be including women in this challenge how are we going to be including women and re-skill them as we were saying a few minutes before in all the digital uh, area especially in countries like ours in mexico where we have a very different uh, very different areas where we have women that are pretty far behind in all the digital arena. So the big problem is how are we going to be uh, attending the most important things in the color, uh, the most important things at this moment, but at the same time, we have like a very long agenda that we were trying to improve with women where they were fighting for uh, stopping violence. But at the same moment, they need to work. And in order to have them working, we need to have them with digital uh, uh, education. We need to have them very fast in the economic, uh, economic integration. And I think that's what it's like, which thing are we gonna be taking as priority? Uh, and how are we going to be putting all these uh, suggestions worldwide? Because we do have uh, our main problems in Mexico now that we lost 9%. Well, we lost 6 657,000 works. And I think that uh, the main problem we have at this moment is people are fighting and say, do we keep our health or do we keep our work? So the main uh, thing that we're going to be facing at this moment is how do we make a balance in between the two of them? And if we have hospitals that uh, are almost full, what is the balance we're going to have to have? No, How do we give uh, families the 
the, the, the means to be working and to be achieving money to their houses? And how are we going to be postponing not having them sick and not having them in hospitals? Yeah, I mean, this is perfectly saying exactly how do we deal with all of these competing needs and all of them priorities and what is what is that way forward? So, Ashley, from your perspective, this idea of intersectionality and multi-stakeholder, what do you see as some of the barriers from the, the field of academia and, and what's coming up in research? Sure. So um, before you even tackle, I think, the notion of the multi-stakeholders and intersectionality, I think fundamentally there is a misunderstanding as to what we mean when we say social justice. Um, frequently we say uh, social justice, people hear one thing and we mean something completely different. And so social justice and social equity is simply about uh, being, being treated fairly, that all people should be treated um, fairly. But frequently that isn't the case. The remedy for social equality is different from social inequity. The remedy for social equality means that we want to treat people equally. The remedy for social inequity is disparate treatment. Um, and sometimes that notion of disparate treatment is why we don't have that understanding and that we have that resistance from what social, and, uh, in terms of understanding what social inequity is. We have socially dominant groups and advantages and privileges of groups of socially dominant groups. We have socially disadvantaged groups and disadvantages of groups of those groups. But we have to learn to acknowledge the unfairness that is in that system before we can even talk about stakeholders. The second aspect that we want to consider is the status quo and the ease with which dominant groups maintain the status quo. In organizations, there usually exists two systems, one system of meritocracy and one system of privilege and oppression. We often recognize the system of meritocracy, but we don't recognize that system of privilege and oppression that works in our organizations because it can be threatening, right? To our self-worth, our self-value to say, we didn't necessarily completely uh, get all of our accomplishments uh, on our own. And so that can be problematic. So of course, let's get the definition down. Of course, let's recognize that um, people don't acknowledge social justice because of these threats and they put their defensive mechanisms up. Now, if we try to tackle multi-stakeholders, what we have to fundamentally recognize is that social justice is no different than any other, any other agenda. And that is uh, the problem and the reason why it can't necessarily advance with multi-stakeholders is that everybody wants a piece of that social equity pie, but we can't all eat at the same time. If you start talking about race, people say, well, what about gender? And what about, yeah. you know, um, social, what about uh, religion? And what about all these other things? It's okay to talk about one topic at a time. But what you do is you say, we're going to focus on race. But within race, we have various different categories. We have women, and we have men, and we have religion, and we have these differences. But you have to focus on one thing at a time because the historical inequities and historical context that has given rise to a difference in racial inequality, inequity, a difference in gender inequity, a difference in religious inequity, they're all different. So it's okay to focus on one topic at a time, but recognize there are multiple layers. And so our inability to do that, I think, has contributed to our inability to move this multi-stakeholder uh, approach forward. Peter and Carmine, I, Peter, I'll come to you first. I think that is, I mean, considering when you look at Bloomberg and you are looking at signing up to several different initiatives, giving individual focus, but then part of a collective good. How do you want to respond to what Ashley's just said? Well, I think Karma and I enjoy a little bit of a special position in this august group that we've assembled to talk about this subject, and that is we are products of the practical as much as we are anything else. And our responsibility, his as chairman and CEO, and mine as chairman and chairman of our executive committee, along with my six colleagues on the executive committee, is to obviously try and become an exemplar in Bloomberg of what people talk about with regard to diversity diversity, equality, and inclusion. And, and we've evolved in our thinking over the last six or seven years where we initially focused heavily on women and people of color. We've evolved into the LGBTQ community. We've evolved into colleagues with disability and making sure that they feel as though they are both welcome and can bring their whole selves to work every single day. And really using the Bloomberg 
envelope, if you will, as a, a test ground for doing a, a range of different things. And we have lots of programs that are underway where we're trying to make a more meaningful impact. It all, in, in my judgment, boils down to the tone at the top of the organization and the leadership exhibited by the senior executives who are lucky enough to be in a position of responsibility to really help do something about this challenge around racial inequality and all that goes with it. We also have the kind of unique position as a global provider of news, data, and analytics with multiple platforms to be able to use those platforms to influence people thinking and making sure that they are focused on the severity and the responsibility of these issues going forward. And we try and use that as well. And then the third thing that we do are engagement in activities at the World Economic Forum. Carmine and I are both members of the New York City CEO Jobs Council that Jamie Dimon started about a year ago. We are very proactive in Chicago, for example, in skilling and, and allowing people to compete more effectively for jobs going forward. So the intersectionality occurs in a lot of different places. I think the responsibility of leadership is to identify that and lead and execute as we go forward. Uh, Carmine, I do you as the global CEO of over 300,000 employees, all with different areas of interest and passion, how, do you, how are you finding juggling that? And are you feeling that pressure moving forward as to have a more holistic approach with the balance of the individual agendas? Yeah, so, so thanks, Caroline. Um, the, look, to me at EY, uh, and, and our culture really embeds DNI, and it's been that for you know, 30 years uh, since I joined. And so that's important. I do think we have to talk a little bit more about the role of business. You know, as Peter mentioned, you know, today it is extremely important that all business leaders, you know, from the top um, have the right sense in terms of what it comes to in terms of DNI. And I think, you know, it's more important than ever because in many places around the world, I think, you know, governments have struggled with this. And unless businesses really help, um, we're going to struggle. So even today in, in one of the Edelman uh, surveys, you know, 66% or two thirds of the people think that CEOs have to play a bigger role in, in, in justice, in social justice, in, in, in the causes. So we, we at EY, um, you know, have been very proactive when it comes to DNI and same, same as Peter, we were more heavily weighted towards gender. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we then became more, you know, more weighted towards LGBTQ, you know, as well as gender. And really, I think the George Floyd incident in the United States woke us up a little bit that we probably weren't as focused on people of color, not just in the United States, but around the world. And so we actually set up a global uh, task force uh, around this issue. And uh, it's really incredible when you see our global task force on these screens and you see, you know, 50 people from around the world dealing with the same issue. This is not just a US issue. And that's what I think is great. The George Floyd situation really opened people's eyes all over the world. And it's great to see that this is now at the top of the agenda um, in terms of making sure that we solve you know, the inequity problems and the racial problems around the world. So, so that part I think has, has helped. Um, but the barriers, Caroline, you know, to me, the barriers are really around you know, and as Peter said, some of the uh, thinking from the top in these organizations is not a long-term right. thinking. It's a short-term thinking. And so companies aren't willing to invest. They aren't willing to in, in some of the things that we have to get done. And because of that, they're not really thinking long-term. And frankly, it's not working. People being left behind. Uh, and so this is something that's become obvious through the pandemic, as the video showed when we started. And it's something that we have to solve. Now's the time to solve it. There's a lot of momentum, um, you know, as we move forward, and as we come out of the pandemic. Minister, if we come to what Carmine has just said on this long-term look to the future, which is difficult in governments as much as in business, um, and how, what are some of those policies that you are seeing or are, are going into place? And also how you can support, I guess, the business community as well as you're moving forward so the business community can work in partnership with governments? Okay, one of the things that I, uh, that I agree that they have been saying is how CEOs have to be more realistic now about how to put in their 
all equation, not only uh, making money, but social justice, and also how they're going to be working with governments and with the uh, society and the people left behind. I think that the pandemic has helped us a lot to put an eye in something that we did not put it before. And we also have another thing in Mexico, which has to be do with my, my migration. Migration also plays an important role in here. And now I'm going to go back to trying to answer your question. First of all, Mexico has, as I said before, has lost a lot of uh, jobs. And uh, one of the things that we believe it is very important is that President Lopez Obrador has has as a main issue all the time working with social justice and trying to uh, give a hand to those people left behind. One of the main things we are doing at this moment, it is trying to make infrastructure development in the south part of Mexico. As for that, when we have uh, more infrastructure on the southern part of the country, we can have those people and better jobs there. And uh, a lot of people, indigenous people and people uh, that have less education or less formal education in our country is pretty much concentrated on the south. So we believe that the train Maya, the, the Maya train and the interoceanic is a connection that we're going to be having there. It is going to be very important So uh, because some other business are going to be getting there, some more investment is going to be getting there. And what we're trying to do is that the uh, uh, business that come mm -hmm. around those big in infrastructure infrastructure. Uh, development has to do with a uh, local investment uh, involving the people from the little cities, involving the people from that community in the development. Otherwise, we're just going to have big uh, business coming into this and the people are going to be uh, doing like the same things we have done in other places. They're going to be just workers that get paid very low instead of being like partners in some areas and having them better development. Other, some of the other things we are doing at this moment uh, is, as I said before, including women, but including women in many areas. And that has to do with uh, the digital transition in all ages and also reconverting or reskilling women in different areas. Uh, we have been working with not only with the government, but also with business and some embassies as to uh, help uh, having them work together with us and help us re-skill the women in all the areas that are uh, e-commerce. Most of these women have little commerce or have little uh, stores. They need to be introduced in the new way to deliver the products and doing like a, a change with other areas so they can be selling the products. Some of the other things that we have been including is helping the small business with some of, uh, credits and some amount of money so they can keep on moving on and moving the local economics in their towns. And that's one of the things where we have been putting a lot of emphasis. For that, we have had two... Uh, in the digital inclusion programs, we have something uh, that we did that it's called a, um, a platform that includes the, all the little business. So people can see that all national wise and we can keep on moving the uh, local commerce. Uh, some of the, all the other things we did is we have uh, been doing a lot of work with businessmen as to uh, be working especially in a small companies, the SMEs, which we believe that they are the ones that are suffering the most. We have more or less 80% of those companies in our country. And if we don't put emphasis and we don't provide little credits for those ones, I think we're gonna be losing the main, the main change of uh, the economics. Yeah, I, I, think, I think one of the things that we, the difference between small and medium business and large it's very business different. is <laughs> very different. And I'm sure both Peter and Carmine can speak to that. I've been given the flag for five minutes. It's insane that we have to try and have a conversation like this in such a short period of time. But I want to come back to something, Ashley. You, we've heard about Carmine and Peter speaking to the importance of business leadership. We've heard the minister say that is a really important collaboration with government. Look, you're, you're at the, the front face of research 
around diversity and equity and inclusion within business. What, what is the research telling us? And I know you spoke to the importance of talking about individual before we even talk about multi agendas, but what's the research telling us? Yeah, you know, to keep it short and curt, I think Carmine and Peter have done a lot of the work in answering that question for us, right? And here's what I mean. What they both have described in their companies are exemplars that many leaders should aspire to be. When we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, Caroline, frequently what people do is they describe it as a program, as an initiative, yeah. as an event. That means something singular in nature. That means that once that goal is accomplished, we're done, right? They're finished. But what Peter and Carmine said is that diversity, equity, and inclusion has to be an integral part of our organization. So just as we set revenue goals for our organization, we need to every year set diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Just as we have tactics and strategies that accomplish our revenue goals, we need tactics and strategies that accomplish our, um, our, D, our diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. And just as we have measurements and analysis that assess our revenue goals, goals we need measurement and analysis that also assesses the diversity and equity inclusion goals. So it has remained at the forefront. The second thing, Caroline, that I would tell you that we know about over the last year is that oftentimes people make the mistake, okay? Organizations make the mistake and they start with the output as opposed to the input. Many people want to say representation. What we want to do is we want to make sure that we have a diverse organization, but they don't want to do the work to ask themselves, how did we get here in the first place, right? They have to ask what, what decision-making processes were in place. What's our culture like, right? What are our shared values and beliefs? Because if you hire these individuals and you bring into them into an organization that does not value diversity, representation, representative, this equity, um, how uh, people feel, uh, the fairness uh, that's associated with uh, that diversity, and then also the, the inclusion, meaning they don't feel belong, but they don't feel belonging, it's not going to work. So it has to come from the top and it has to be this integrative notion. And that's what the research is telling us. That's what the best practices is telling us. And that's what the last uh, uh, 10 months, uh, the last few months since the George Floyd killing has taken place and the initiative that we've seen um, be implemented, that's what it's telling us. Caroline, let me I, mention one other thing. You get uh, 30 seconds, Peter. 30 you've seconds. You've got 30 <laughs> seconds. And that that's is, all you get, my friend. <laughs> this, is a, this is a race without a finish line. We should not expect things to change overnight, but we should be judged on the long-term impact that we have on these critical issues. And that I believe strongly, and I think Carmine would agree with me, is the responsibility of leadership and organizations like ours, but all of us around this panel for our responsibility to contribute our fair share to make it happen. But it's gonna take time, we've gotta be persistent, and we got to get it done. And everybody recognizes that. You're absolutely right. And we also got to know and say what we don't have the answers. And I think that's it, is to keep questioning yeah. and make the time to innovate and to fail. Um, I am being shouted at over the phone. So um, I just want to say, this is really hard. Um, I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. What we're going to do now is end the public part of this. I ask the panelists to stay on here with us. For the members of the forum, please um, dial off and go back on again through Toplink for the interactive session, which will begin in two minutes. Um, and to the public, thank you so much uh, for bearing with us. Sorry, this conversation is so short, but I want to say a huge thank you to Peter, to Minister Kutier, to Carmine and to Ashley. Thank you very much, everyone.